Well, for those who watched the University of Florida football against LSU, first I want to lead off with that uh that happened, didn't it? Let alone, well, let alone the Gators lose by two scores as predicted. It was and we knew Jay and Daniels was gonna show up. We knew all this. Everything that we thought was going to happen, happened. No one predicted that we would witness the greatest performance in the history of college football in this game. Whether or not the Gator defense needs to have a, a stern talking to, no one says that they don't. But all it, it's it's almost like with C.J. Stroud having his coming out party with the Tampa against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You also have to just look and say that guy just had the greatest game ever played. He's the first guy in FBS history with 300 yards passing, 300 plus yards in the air, and 200 or or more rushing yards. It is insane. LSU had 702 total yards of offense, the most the Gators have ever given up in a game by quite a bit. We've seen some rough Gator games. It's weird how almost yet still this doesn't feel as bad as the loss to Arkansas. You know what I mean? Like it's still, it probably was the worst. It was the worst defensive showing in the history of Gator football. They gave up 52 points. It still doesn't feel as bad as last week. If you're at least from my perspective. You know the it's fine meme, you know, like the the house. For the yeah, world. yeah, yeah. It's funny because I feel like every week we try to bring in like the oh the silver linings, the it's fines of every possible miserable situation. You know we- how I've resorted to it wasn't as bad as that other loss. Then <laughs> theory shit, it was not as bad as this one. Hey. Hey, I mean, at least this time Florida fell forward into the end zone a number of times. But they did. They did. Okay. By the way. Trevor Etienne, I feel like in any other game, a performance like that wins you a football game. It is somehow to me still baffling that Trevor Etienne doesn't get 20 plus carries a game. He didn't get 20 plus again today. He had 18 carries today. There are if he was getting 18 consistently. I don't think anyone would be like questioning it. It's when he only has like eight or nine in a game Crazy. where it's an issue. And let's just call it as it is. We know this offense at times has limitations, and we know also LSU's defense isn't truly spectacular. They have given up a number of points as well. But when you look at Florida's offense, there are two key playmakers that stand out that Mertz can dispose the ball to, and that is Trevor Etienne. And that is Eugene Trey Wilson. I mean, those guys should be touching the ball. I mean, at, at any sequence, in any four down sequence, hey, more. Downs, at least two of those downs. And I don't care how absurd that is, because if you want to bring up anything that we should be doing differently, well, we have been doing it differently than that. And we are now 500. And if they don't win one of these next two games, they will not be making a bowl game. And as we, we know, all know, by the way, it's if they don't beat Mizzou, they're not going bowling. I, there's yeah. what scenario do they beat Florida State? Like, All I right. know it's going to be a more than 0% chance to win. But I just want to know, when you do the 10,000 simulations, yeah, I'm actually, what does I'm that glad, scenario look like? I'm glad that you brought that up because I actually do think that if Florida is going to win one of these next two, which I don't think that they will, but I think if they were to win one of these next two, it actually would be the matchup against Florida State. They barely hung on at home to beat Miami this week, 27-20. to We just saw what LSU was capable of, and I know we can go all the way back to week one when Florida State uh, did beat LSU. These two teams are on completely different trajectories right now. Florida State is escaping narrowly with victories. If I had to say Florida has better chances against Missouri, I don't think so. Not the way Missouri looked against Georgia two weeks ago. We just saw what Georgia did to Ole Miss today. It wasn't even remote. We also saw what Mizzou did to Tennessee. Yes. Missouri is a much better team 
than we've given them credit for. And I think they're well, getting I better. I was and just I saying, and I wasn't saying that, like, I think Mizzou is a pushover. They're not. No, no, I'm no. saying if you had to hedge your bets and decide the 10-0 and 0 Florida State team that's a top four team or Missouri, who is still a ranked team, but not the better team of the two. I guess if you want to make the argument that Mizzou is on the road and we all know Florida's history under Billy Napier with road games, as in they have two wins, both of them to underperforming SEC schools, then maybe in that regard, yes, because you also have the argument of, well, at least they're in the swamp. It's a rivalry game. They'll more likely show up. But is that really? I just don't see it either. I, and again, I don't see them winning either one of these games. No. But I would say, here's I'm going to make my case for why I think the better option, the better chance that Florida has to win is against Florida State. We look at Missouri. Yes, the record isn't as good, but they lost to LSU and they lost to Georgia. Those were two very good SEC programs year in and year out. And Georgia, I, I don't care what the college football playoff committee says right now. They're the number one team in the country. They're not number two. And you can take – I will take that to the bank. Especially and after this weekend. The next thing I will say is, yes, I think the home in a way does matter. I get it. We had the abysmal loss to Arkansas that is just inexcusable. But – we, I know we were able to find a way to sweep past a what I think is a mediocre South Carolina team. I don't think they're all that great. I think Missouri's miles better than they are, and we barely were able to get past them. It was by two points. Now, you come, you come back home for the final game against Florida State, who's been squeaking by teams, with a bowl game on the line, because odds are they're probably not going to beat Missouri, so they're still going to need this win to clinch a bowl game. With a bowl game on the line, I think the team will be able to be – I think they'll be fired up for that game. I really do. I think, obviously, we know how good the home crowd is at the Swamp. I think if there's any chance that Florida has at getting that sixth win, I don't think it's coming against a Missouri team that, again, we've been sleeping on, and I get they're not a pushover, like you said. But I think that this team is actually really good, and I know their record isn't what Florida State is. But, again, they played Georgia. Florida State hasn't played Georgia – And again, week one to now, we've seen teams unfold and change for better or worse. I think at home with everything on the line, with a bowl game on the line, with the home crowd at their backs, I think that's the best chance Florida has to win, even if the rankings say or declare that Florida State's better than Missouri. Uh, You know, you make a very good point. One thing you mentioned just like that, you, you alluded to the urgency. I know LSU pulled way ahead at the end. But one thing I felt like I did see more of this game was a sense of urgency. And it's because they know if they don't win another game, their season's over after Thanksgiving. They definitely played that way. It's just they ran out of gas and they couldn't handle Jay and Daniels anymore. And 700 yards later, that's not even hyperbole. That's just a fact. (laughs) you have the final score of uh, 52 to 35. And we're also just to go back quickly to another point that I feel changed the game against LSU. Khalil Jackson looked like he had a catch. It's overturned. LSU goes and gets another score. And Florida seems just like they never recover. Because at one point they were up. 28 to 24. I think they're already down again once this play happens. Just how much do you feel that really was a turning point in this game, or is it more just the inevitable? Yeah, I, I don't think that one play was as much as the as just what Florida has been throughout the course of the season. Because hypothetically, let's say they go down and make that play. Uh the bottom line is, and I and I love Austin Armstrong. I think he's great, but this was one of those games where it's like, yeah, the he was going, he was in a chess match with a master offensive coordinator, offensive schemer in Brian Kelly, who has been doing this for much longer, much, much longer. And 
it's one of those that I think is a valuable experience for him because I think he's going to be able to take and learn a lot from this experience. And I get that he didn't have a number of defensive players on his, on his side of the ball in this game, but over 700 yards, he was clearly out coached. And again, I would have expected as such with somebody who has had the tenure that Brian Kelly has had in college football and the experience that comes along with it, with just Austin Armstrong, who's entering the game, who's shown flashes of promise and potential. This is one of those, you go back and you look at everything that you, that, that you go back into the film room and you just pick that apart and learn as much as you can. And, um, you know, kind of pick the brain of some coaches that have been around a while that have faced off against Brian Kelly and somehow, and some of them that have been able to defeat him and maybe get advice down the road. So I think this, in in a way was good for Austin Armstrong, but again, completely outcoached today by just a better, a better run and a more also a more talented offense that LSU was able to put on the field. Yeah. No, and I agree. And and I know Twitter doesn't represent anything or X. I'm what are you talking about? It's all it's all factual. My point was like you go down the replies after the game and everyone's calling for Austin Armstrong's head even though he got all the praise in the world the first like six or seven games of the year. It's like, look, this guy's in his first year. He's 30. I still think some something's coming together here, even if it's just, you know, you're facing tougher competition and things are you, – you have something ready to say. I'm just going to let you say. I see I, – I, you're plotting. I see – just say it. Well, one, I'm just going to say, well, one, because I don't spend a lot of time on Twitter, so I didn't see any of these posts. But if somebody out there is actually saying or even suggesting that they need to replace Austin Armstrong or if anything, that he is the problem, they didn't watch Florida football for the past, I don't know, like five years with Todd Grantham because that was it it may have been one bad game, but look at the course of the entire season. I mean – Wait for some of these players to come in and see if he can coach those guys. I mean, to say that, and I'm not talking to you, obviously, because I don't think you think this, but whoever. No, I don't think this. I only brought up the social media comments because I knew how you would respond to those. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I, you know, that's, that's, that has to be trolls. They all have to be trolls. I'm not even going to. There, no, me. no, they're not trolls. They're, they're genuine Florida fans who. That's These that. are the same people that called for Dan Mullen to be fired after going like 10 and two, because he wasn't making the playoff. You know, it's, it's just, um, and I'm not saying that these types of games are inexcusable, but I also just know they're not trolls because I remember having discussions with other Florida fans, even like, and this was like before, Mullins last season this is coming off the 2020 season where you know again they went eight and four but still they were in the hunt they are in the sec championship game and people were saying mullen is still in it look i mean they kind of had their point proven right with mullen being canned but it, after that last season, I, know, I mean, at, at this point, I know we can, I know it's like right now, it feels like a long ways they're, away. No, their point, what I'm trying to say is they all, they're, they're definitely feeling justified in their thoughts. I'm going to say though, after coming off all those New Year's six bowls and, you know, double digit win seasons, I've just never understood why someone can say this coach needs to be replaced. Like you imagine if Penn State fans were saying fire James Franklin. I I I mean that I get a little bit more because just because like you get tired of the same thing over and over and like with a school like Penn State, I like to think Penn State has similar expectations to what the Gator Nation does in in a sense where it's like like we look at Penn State as outsiders and we look at them as oh well they're not Michigan and they're not Ohio State. People at Penn State are like, wait a minute, we've had our history too, and we know that we can hang in and hang in there with those teams as well. When you can't beat those teams repeatedly over and over again, that will wear down. That yes, wear down. but also, would you rather be in be us? Yeah, situation? No. no, like I think 
anyone should rather go get 10 wins every year, win that good bowl game. Cause you know how hard it is to find someone who's going to do better? I'm sorry, but just because you're not Jim Harbaugh doesn't mean you're doing something, you're doing something wrong. It's just how it is. And look, and again, there were issues with Mullen outside of that situation. But if you consistent, if I just think if Napier is in the exact same situation, almost maybe he isn't getting this. I don't even know what's to say anymore. It's just, it's complicated. The point, my point was that they're not. Benefit of the doubt, maybe. Benefit of the doubt, maybe. Is that what you're trying to say? Well, I guess in his situation, he'd get a benefit of the doubt because he would have gone from the six and six that he started off with or that Mullen finished with, you know, the same way Mullen had that same start with McIlwain, even though Mullen inherited the talent, he just had to call the plays that McIlwain couldn't. It's it's complicated just because like and my and this back to I digress completely because the point was those were not trolls. It's you have to understand, like, who would you rather roll with Todd Grantham, who couldn't do anything? I mean, look, I know tonight was bad. Hold on. Hold on. I, I don't even want to I, I'm being, hold on a minute. Okay. Don't even finish that question. <laughs> I know what the answer is. You rather have Austin Armstrong. But why is that? A, but why is that a question to begin with? This is like it shouldn't be a question. But isn't that my point? That's, I know. That's why I'm wondering if they're trolls because it's like, are we that? Are, I'm, no, like, that's I'm, no, that's the thing. These people are serious. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a sarcasm though. It's like it's they're serious, but like it's so abysmal that the like, same oh, people who are like, oh, we should have kept these people. No, you call for these people to be fired for three years. You got what you want. You can't just say, I changed my mind, undo button. That's not how the world works. No, this is this is great because we don't have a special teams coach. I don't know what our play calling identity is. We have a number, we have a 500 record and we can't seem to beat any good teams. And then we look down the line at anybody that, at any positives, and we're going to say, oh, the problem here might actually be the lone bright spot of this entire staff. Blows my mind. It, always, it just takes one game, one I game. swear, for fans to turn on a guy. One game. And one I know game. they've they've had games where they've given up a decent amount of points. Look, and... If you're punishing someone because they got curb stomped by Georgia, I don't know what to tell you. Being everybody, like it's been like the last time Georgia lost a game, there was another president in office. So it's like, okay, they are running the show and it is a tough call. The last time they lost a regular season game. Also, can we say, yeah. And also, can we say that also Jaden Daniels is actually really good? Like, yeah, is that, no, he's, this guy's like, probably going to, this guy's the Heisman favorite now. You should be. I mean, they're gonna get. There's still gonna be panics because they're undefeated, and I get, and I get that, and I get how. Tough I mean, hold up like, though. Like, and I know maybe it's because I've been watching the SEC network for this broadcast, showing you know Tebow, uh, RG three, Lamar Jackson, but yes, I mean, Penix is gonna obviously be a finalist. Right. I don't necessarily think anymore he's gonna win the Heisman because now it's comes that if it's if it's truly for the best player. I think now it's Jay and Daniels. Absolutely is Jay and Daniels. He's, he's, he's ridiculous. And I mean, obviously, you know. Just I, what he does both from the air and from the ground. He is a team's rushing yards leader. We saw this last year, too. I mean, it's not huh. like it's like it's not like people shouldn't be surprised by this. We saw Jaden Daniels do this in the swamp last year against Anthony Richardson. And it was that's when that was kind of surprising. It was like, whoa, okay, like. I didn't know Jane Daniels had all this in his in his in his arsenal, but he's got it. And now it's like, all right, we know what he is, and he's explosive. He's a playmaker. He can do it with his legs. He can do it with his arm. He's got players around him that make plays. Ryan Kelly's a good offensive coach. We've seen it for years. And Armstrong's the problem because he got out coached by some kind of um, you know, long-standing veteran coach who has an incredible track record of winning games, especially in the regular season. This is absolutely absurd to me. So anybody that thinks Austin Armstrong's the problem hasn't really been paying attention that much to Florida Gators football all season and more so are caught as a prisoner in the moment of what happened today. 
Was this a, this performance any way justifiable for him? No, but again, no, he's still going to have a tough explanation for this one. And you know what? It's good for someone to just sit there and be like, I got nothing. I got beats. Yeah. Cause it's like you said earlier, it's a good learning experience. Great learning experience. It's like, how do I make sure this never happens to me again? Even though the reality is he has to be stuck with the fact that he gave up a historic outing. How do I, how do I never get hit? How do I never get rolled over by a dumb truck again? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, it was I think, something. I mean, the solution is that he never has to play this guy ever again. I have to imagine Daniels is going to the NFL, but yeah, I mean, wait, he is, wait, I forget. Jane Daniels, he is, yeah, he's SEC graduate, so he's eligible. He would be let's, going let's, to the draft this year. Gator fans, let's get into the league. Let's get into the league. Yeah, I thought I'd seen enough of Jane Daniels in the SEC. Yeah, send, him, send him off, send him off. This is Daniels, you're good. You're good. Go to Tampa. Tampa needs a quarterback. I hear. Let's go. Yeah. You know what's funny? Remember when the worst performance we would talk about was Drew Locke in 2018? We're never. This is the last time I'm probably ever going to reference it because now all we're going to talk about is this game. And you know what? And I and I understand this. I under like. And again, this is a we're harping back to a previous episode that we talked about where the where people are like, you got to preach patience with Billy Napier and so on and so on and so on. Why is it that Missouri is ahead of Florida right now? Right? Like, I mean, at some point, and they're in the same division. Like, we're starting to run out of excuses here. Well, I mean, I guess that's true, but at the same time, too. Heupel did it in two years. I, Kirby's obviously in a different class because Kirby's Kirby, but he did it in two years. Drinkwitz with Missouri is figuring things out. Mark Stoops took him a little bit of a longer time. But again, every coach that I just mentioned in the SEC. Right, again, East, right, right, again, Kentucky, I mean, though, that's a team that always has a good start and then finds a way to finish seven and five. It's like yeah, it's really it that big well, of a success for him. Right, but they didn't, they didn't used to be Florida, so that's a big success for Kentucky. They've won against Florida three years in a row. Look, I mean, if you also just want to talk uh, Eli Drinkwitz, fi- uh, I'm just looking at his uh, record since he became the head coach. Right. Five and five, six and seven, six and seven, eight and two. Patience, perhaps. I mean, I, I'm sure if a f- someone hears me say this, I'm sure they're going to be like, if they don't want a Mike Norvell, they're probably going to also say, oh, we don't want Eli Drinkwitz. But at the same time, I don't know. Right now, this guy's eight and two. The Rays winning games. Missouri's winning games in the same division Florida's in. Like, yeah, like why you wouldn't you want to coach? Why wouldn't you want to coach yeah, that point. is winning games just because they still aren't at your standard? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, I totally get you. I totally get you. Um, I think it's just hard to even put yourself in that spot because it feels like it feels like that's where they were. At least that's where Florida was when they at least were under Dan Mullen. Like, yes, the last year was a complete spiral like down the stretch. But when you looked at it, it was like, oh, they just need like they're like a two. They're a play away. Like like in 2019, they lost to Georgia by like a touchdown. Or And, and they asked yeah. Mullen in the postgame press conference. Came down to the fact that the offense couldn't score 20 points. Right. And then the next year, they were able to beat Georgia. And they were able to get over that hump. And, and then obviously in 2018, they beat LSU with Burrow. And they were able to – the point is, at least with Mullen, they found ways to win these games that maybe they weren't supposed to win. They were capable of doing it. It was just a matter of putting it together in a consistent manner and staying out of their own way, hence the shoe game down the stretch of the 2020 season. Now it just seems like it's like, man, it's like it just it, it doesn't seem anything even close to that. It's not a roller coaster of anything. It's just like, give me something. I just want to see this team start winning again, man. I don't know how long it's going to take. I get it's patience, but it's it's just hard. I, to see I hate to be that guy, like as much as I want to see it, there's always a sad reality. This could just become an, a total Nebraska situation. It's where bad. I don't want to laugh at that, but it's, it's, it really No, but it's true. Like, And also, we can also look to Miami, where just, you know, oh, yeah, remember when this team was good, you know? And it's crazy because now, like, Nebraska is just happy they have five wins. Gonna be forty, and we're gonna be lucky to make the Gasparilla Bowl. We're gonna be like, "Woo, hang the banner!" No, I mean, like the Gators are gonna keep being in bowl games. Oh, the point so is bad. that there's a point where just like 
it's good. The, the good years are going to be further and further into the past. And a good year suddenly is eight and four. Yeah, maybe one year we'll debut like purple uniforms or something too. You know, who knows? Who knows what's happening next? We debuted black. I mean, you could. We've done the uh, swamp green. I mean, whatever, whatever's coming next. Who knows? What was, didn't they do those scales against A and M in twenty seventeen? Yeah. Yeah. Weren't those cents? So, yeah. <laughs> what? I'm, so so, I'm glad I missed that. that game. I went to a lightning game instead, and that was a great decision. It's just amazing. Like it's almost like a comical fall. Like it's a co- it's not it's not even like a it's not even like the tragedy of the Florida Gators who were once legendary and have fallen from grace and it's a sad story. It's almost funny in a way. Like it's just, you know, just another reality check too. The Florida Gators history is a tale of Steve Spurrier with a hint of Urban Meyer. That's a big hint of Urban Meyer. It's a big but, hint. It's a big hint. But right. also remember Urban Meyer's around for four years. Like people five don't years, understand. five years. Five years. Like, like, it really, it really just. <laughs> just because I'm still convinced that if Spurrier had stuck around, because he was still in the league till 2015, there, I, I will always say there is an alternate universe where he's just he, there the whole time. I still think he gets Tebow and Percy Harvin and goes and wins those national championships. I am going to stand, I am going to sit here for once and defend Urban Meyer because I know almost everybody in Gator Nation won't. Uh, and for whatever reasons they may have, some justified, some not justified. The dude won two championships at University of I'm Florida. not saying oh, he is well, Let me finish. Let me finish this statement. I'm not saying that you're saying that it's not implied, but what I am saying, this is a message for anybody out there at UF because that is still bitter about the whole Urban Meyer situation, how it unfolded. At the end of the day, this dude won more national championships at University of Florida for their football program in less time than any coach ever has in the entire history of this program. And as we've seen year after year, Florida has consistently post Meyer era underachieved to the standard that every fan wants to see them get back to. And that's winning championships. So urban Meyer gets so much disrespect from Gator nation. And I get some of these reasons are valid, but at the end of the day, he did what is now what I am realizing now growing up and being not a kid anymore, realizing that winning is hard, possibly the most impossible thing that you could expect a coach to do at University of Florida. Not only win a national championship, win not multiple. only win a national championship, but win two in three years, almost instantaneously after he was hired. So, yeah, he may have had his baggage and his flaws, and he's not a perfect coach, and he didn't work in the NFL, and he and he had – and he had all sorts of that was not one of my points, right? Not you, but um, this is a message for all Gator Nation that have you know spoken down about Urban Meyer. The dude is an absolute legend, and I get that off the field it hasn't been perfect, but he should be at least considered to be up in that ring of honor because he's done something that not many Gators have done, and he's arguably one of the greatest coaches Florida football has ever had. Mike that Trump. is that is his TED talk, guys. That Mike is his TED talk, and I think. I think we're going to leave it here for this episode. Four Gators, they they lose in a historic fashion to the LSU Tigers. On to the next Tiger team with Mizzou next week. I'm sure we'll have all of our thoughts. Oh, my God. I'm sure we'll have just the same kind of thoughts we are having now next week. I'm Harrison. That's Josh. This is the Awkward Sports Podcast on the Awkward Sports Media YouTube channel. Make sure to follow us on all of our socials. We're on TikTok, Twitter, slash X, Instagram. We will see you next time.